This week for Dead Feb, you can fully customize the Togo wallet. You can choose whatever color of thread and whatever color of leather for each individual panel. And it's just a little promotion we do to keep things rolling here at the shop because January and February are so dead for us. So we do this little promotion to hopefully incentivize you guys to order some wallets. So check them out below. Welcome to Arch March, where we're gonna cut apart a bunch of popular high arch arch support footwear, starting with Westco's. One of the last remaining Pacific Northwest boot brands that we haven't covered. They're pretty different from the rest of the Pacific Northwest brands because they're not from that auto white family tree. So we're finally gonna find out the truth of Westco boots by cutting them in half and running them through all of our tests to see what's what with Westco boots. There's three indisputable best flavors in the world. Leather, obviously, coffee, and whiskey. And you can get two out of three of those from the Morning Dram, the sponsor of this video, and you've probably seen them on the Roseanville 2 channel. They've basically single-handedly funded that whole project. And what really makes them unique is they make coffee that's infused with whiskey flavors. And the way they do it is they age coffee beans in X whiskey barrels to slowly infuse the coffee beans with that whiskey flavor. Zero alcohol in it. It's just slight hints of that whiskey flavor. And the owner of the Morning Dram, Tommy, he's a big boot head. He's got some Red Wings, he's got some Alden, so he understands quality and patience and craftsmanship, and that really is echoed in his products. And they make more than just whiskey flavored coffee. They also have your regular coffee, and you can try out both of these with their couple different box sets they have. They have a starter kit that's a really great place to start. Individually, the value would be $138 if you bought them individually, but the starter pack costs $99. That includes three bags of coffee, bourbon rye, and a non-aged house blend, and a house grinder, and a stainless steel dripper, and an orange camp mug. If you already have your coffee set up, figured out, and you got a grinder, a better option might be their combo box. It comes with four of the most popular coffees, two barrel-aged whiskey and rye, and two single-origin non-aged Ethiopia and Guatemala. So give the morning dram a try. I'll put links to everything in the description so you can get yourself one of those box sets, because it really is is a unique flavor and I bet you've never tried anything quite like it. So check them out below and thanks again to The Morning Dram. Let's quickly go over their history because it's pretty interesting and I think if you like this style of footwear, you'll like this story because it all started in 1903 when John Shoemaker traveled west from Michigan and ended up in Portland. And he got a job at the Bradley Shoe Company and then at the Goodyear Shoe Company. And in 1918, after 10 years in the industry, he started his own boot company called the West Coast Shoe Company, shortened to be West Co. And he started making timber boots, which are basically logger boots with the little spikes on the bottom or, or corks. One really interesting is he would travel to those remote camps, take the measurements of the loggers feet, return back home to Portland, make the boots, and then hand deliver them back to the guys out in those remote camps. And over the next couple decades, Westco continued to grow and change. Due to the Great Depression, John moved Westco out of Portland and into Scapoose, Oregon. And then in 1938, they started producing some of their more popular boots with the Highliner boot meant for climbing poles telephone poles, and their job master, which is Westco's all-purpose work boot, that this is a job master. And then later that year, maybe the next year, they, they came out with the boss boot, which is a pull-on boot that was made for ship welding during the war. In 1961, John Shoemaker dies. And then in the 70s, they start to get a little bit more popularity. And then in the 1980s, they had a big change in the company because they used to make all their boots with fully nailed construction. So basically the whole sole was put on by nails with not as much stitching. And then in the 80s, they switched over to the stitch down construction that has really been popularized by the Pacific Northwest brands for this style of boot. And then in 1991, the Boss Boot had another resurgence because Arnie wore them in Terminator 2. And then in 2004, Leonardo DiCaprio wore a pair of custom Westco boots for the movie The Aviator. And fast forward to the present year, 2023, 105 years after they started Westco Boots. The current CEO is the grandson of John Shoemaker. So it's still a family owned business. And one in interesting thing is they sell only one third of their boots produced in America. Two thirds are shipped outside of America, including the big presence that they have in Japan. Lots of the Japanese Americana culture love Westco Boots. But they also have a bunch of other random niches that they're in. If you go look at their tagged photos, they have a strong presence in the kink community. There's a lot of men wearing a lot of leather with a lot of Westco Boots on. So they've got a really wide spanning history that has this unique story that we've seen over and over again with these Pacific Northwest boots that started out as logging boots, then went to firefighting boots, and then ended up in style boots. And somehow, miraculously, this age old time tested construction style and, and brand of Westco is still around 105 years later. So now that you know the history, what are these boots at $725? Well, this was a really unique collab between Black Bear brand and Westco. So it's a premium price at $725 because it's made of horsehide leather, which we'll cover in the leather section. But their regular boots started around 
$20, but this should give us a really good idea of the construction Westco uses and the materials and how they make their boots, even though it's out of a premium leather and it's a collab. So let's start getting through the details of this, starting with the really unique leather, because this is horsehide. And I don't think we've covered horsehide before. We've covered kangaroo, we've covered lots of cowhide, some other obscured leathers, but horsehide is unique because it's allegedly stronger than cowhide at the same thickness. So how thick is this leather? Well, it's right around two millimeters thick, so a little bit on the thin side for like a work boot. Even with, with uh, red wings, they're usually like, two to 2.5 millimeters thick, and this is pretty standard across the whole boot at two millimeters thick, compared to like the really high end work boots are usually 2.5 to 3.5 at the really heavy end, but still decent thickness of leather. But to see how strong it really is, we wanted to run the puncture test on it. So we ran the puncture test on this, we took 60 pounds of puncture through, and then we took a bunch of other leather samples and ran the exact same test. And as you can see, it, it did perform pretty well, not a big enough difference to tell me for sure that horsehide is more puncture resistant than cowhide. And part of the reason why it's assumed that horsehide is stronger than cowhide is the actual fibers are, it's a finer fiber structure. And the grain, which is that smooth portion of the top bit of the leather is tighter, and the actual fibers themselves are just not as big and chunky. So we ran a burn test to see, since this is a rough out leather, if they perform differently. And to be honest, because it's such a tight fiber structure, it burned a little bit faster than some of the other rough out leather we've seen from a cowhide. So maybe not as flame resistant, but we did a macro shot of the cross section to see if it had the grain and how much grain it had in it. And it still has grain, but it's, it's just not as much as a cowhide. And there's a couple reasons why it might be have less grain. One is because it's a horse, they don't have quite as thick of, of skin. And the second is this is uh, Horween's Chrome Excel, which is a corrected grain leather, where they sand down the very top surface of the leather to give it a more equal and even finish on top. So it does remove a little bit of the grain, but I think it's mostly just the fact that horse hide is not quite as thick. So off of these brief test, it doesn't seem like it's quite as durable as cowhide at two millimeters thick. We didn't do any rip tests, we didn't do any other strength tests, so we'll do those in the future. But the one thing about horsehide is it smells so freaking good. Some people hate it, but I think it's horsehide, horsehide chrome Excel is my favorite smelling leather. And the horsehide is not the only unique thing about this boot, because you might look at this and be like, oh, it's just like every other Pacific Northwest boot, but it's not. It's actually surprisingly different, because the way that the they build these shoes is, is still a stitch down at the vamp and nailed at the heel, but the way they stitch it down at the, the toe is really interesting and really smart. So you see there's two, like basically welt stitches that go around that sew all those layers together. But on the bottom, there's only one visible stitch that goes all the way through the sole. And that's because one of these stitches sews the upper midsole and slip sole together, and the other stitch goes all the way through the outsole. And you might be wondering like, well, what do they do that for? That seems like a little redundant and throws an extra step in the process. Well, the cool thing about this is, once you go to have these resold, all the cobbler has to do is pop these outside stitches, peel off the old outsole, glue a new one on, and sew a single line all the way around, versus how other people do it, where it's sewn all the way through the outsole on both stitches. Once you remove that outsole and that stitch is broken, there is the possibility that the boot's gonna kinda come apart and they might have to relast it, and it's just a lot more delicate process because it's not as strongly secured as it used to be. So it kind of combines the best attributes of a lot of the wedge sole boots that aren't sewn all the way through, making them really easy to resole, plus the strength and durability of having a stitch all the way through the outsole. But the way that they actually do this process is different than the other brands. And it might not be the favorite of some people, and it might be a little bit of surprise, is that they don't hand last them like the rest of the, the competitors. They have machines that last a big portion of this boot. So they have a big machine that before they sew that stitch on, it grabs the upper and stretches it, glues it, pulls it tight, wraps it around the last, and it does the most painstaking process of the boot making job automatically. It makes the process a lot faster and more accurate, but it doesn't allow them to use quite as heavy of leather like that 3.5 millimeter leather we see sometimes. And it's just not as traditional and handmade and that Americana like dudes are just hand lasting your boots and it's potentially not quite as durable. But there is one really odd thing about this boot that I did not expect. This heel stack is not full leather. It's one layer of leather and one layer of compressed cardboard. And I have no idea why they would do that on such an expensive boot. Maybe there's a good reason for it, but I just don't, I can't think of it. I never heard of a good reason why to, to use this material because one argument might be, well, it's not gonna compress and it's not gonna shrink as much. It's not gonna be as, as susceptible to falling apart. 
but I would assume that cr compressed cardboard would fall apart faster and easier than leather. So I have no idea why they didn't just do a full leather heel stack. And the way that they build this heel is also different from the other brands in this price range. Because all those other brands, same thing, hand lasted around. With this boot, they have an automatic nailer that nails all the heel together in the same way. It pulls the heel in tight, hammers all the nails at the same time. They can't do quite as heavy a leather, they can't do quite as heavy of a counter, and they can't do quite as accurate of a job because they do it all at the exact same time. So it has the exact same trade-offs as the auto lasting of the vamp and it's just not as traditional and for the price range it surprised me that they had so much of the process automated and where their lead times aren't as short as you'd expect by having such an automated process that surprised me and then just generally the finishing on this is a little bit sloppy you've got some threads almost going through and like poking through the, the midsole the stitching's not super lined up there's a huge nail poking up through the heel like, and it's not just like a little tip of the nail, like the whole nail, there's like a centimeter of a nail poking through. Super sketchy, easy fix, but not what I would expect from a $725 boot. And then the pull tab on the inside, you can see right here was just sewn on really sloppily. You know, just kind of a rough finished boot, which it is a work boot. And I give them a little bit of a pass for being a work boot, but this is a $725 collaboration boot. So I just thought it'd be finished a lot more finely. So a lot of things I like, a lot of things I don't like. So let's cut these in half and see what's on the inside and finally find out the truth of what's inside Wesco boots. All right, we got them cut in half and there's some weird stuff in here. Some really interesting stuff. So let's see what's inside. So one of the biggest differences is they have a steel shank rather than a leather shank that we've seen in other boots like this, which there's, there's pros and cons. The steel shank is gonna hold its shape a lot more and not com uh, not collapse as much, but it also won't compress as much to the shape of your foot and the arch is a lot more stuck at whatever height you get versus that leather shank compresses and you can really over the course of six months get it to fit you perfectly. It also has a Celastic heel counter, which I thought was really strange for this price point. You know, and, and this part of this is because they have those automatic machines building these boots, you just can't use those ridiculously thick heel counters that are in other Pacific Northwest boots. And to be fair, not that that's a bad thing because I kind of hate how thick those other heel counters are. They just are so big and, and so chunky that they make the boot big and it, and it does give you lots and lots of support. So for a, a heavy duty work boot that you need that stability, you need that cup in your heel, the Celastic's not gonna give that to you, the big chunk of leather will. But for a casual boot, Celastic, I'd almost prefer Celastic. Another thing that's missing in this boot is there's no squeak pad on in between the two layers of the insole and the midsole. This is an issue because though it's glued together, especially with this sprung toe, as you walk on this more and more, those layers are gonna unglue and start sliding across each other and they're gonna start squeaking. And it's the most obnoxious thing. And that's why most brands will put a layer of canvas or some other material so that it's not just leather on leather squeaking. And now that it's cut in half, you can really see that, that heel in the nail that's poking up about a quarter of an inch. We're just fortunate I have dainty little ankles because that would have definitely jammed right into someone's foot if they tried this on for the first time, if you had big old meaty heels. And now you can really see that compressed cardboard in the heel. I don't even think it's leatherboard. I'm, I'm like fairly certain it's just compressed cardboard that we see a lot of times on like the insides of Thursday's boots and the more of a $200 to $300 price range boots. But other than those issues, they're pretty much built to the same standard as the rest of their competitors. You got that really thick leather insole, the thick midsole, slip sole, vibra mount sole, high quality leather uppers. So ultimately not nearly as impressive on the inside as I had hoped. And it is a little bit cheaper at your base rate of $520 compared to the upper 500s of some of the competitors. Not what I expected, but it's not necessarily always a bad thing because some of those really heavy Pacific Northwest boots are too much for a casual boot. And this is clearly built more like a casual boot with the, the thin counter, the automatic processes, uh, just a little bit lighter, more agile version of this style of boot 
which can be a really good thing. So take that for what it's worth. Do I think it's a bad boot? Not even close. This is still better than 99% of the boots out there. And none of these issues would stop me from buying another pair of West Coast. I'd still want a pair of West Coast. Obviously, if I had a nail poking through the hill, it'd be an issue. And I might request that they just do a full leather heel stack. But other than that, I like the boot. And now to the final question, are they worth the price? Well, this particular boot at $725, I think it's a little bit steep. You know, obviously the horse hide's more expensive, but a lot of not what I would expect from a $725. But if this boot had a different leather and was sold for $520, like their base boots are, I think they're within the same ballpark. You know, I still think they're a little bit expensive if you compare it to a spectrum of boots in this price range made in a similar way. But also it's a 105 year history. They've been making boots in the same way. It's one one of these brands that survived through all these different changes and in different industries and they're still making boots today so it shouldn't dissuade you away from buying a pair and a lot of these are just splitting hairs but ultimately that's what we do we split hairs on this channel though it might be dangerously reductive in some people's opinions that's what we do and i love doing it and i think it really informs the consumer on what you're spending your hard-earned money on even at the higher echelon of some of these bespoke work boots or even just casual boots that you that are work boots that you wear as casual boots. So go check out the initial impression video where I do the unboxing and you see my soul slowly leave my body throughout the course of that video. And I want to do a really in-depth dive comparing Westco and every single detail to the other Pacific Northwest boots now that we've covered the majority of them and really see like what's the difference between the auto white family tree compared to the Westco family tree compared to Viberg and really start putting the really specific details in the differences between these boots. So if you like this video, support it, and let me know if you want to see that video. It probably will go up on the Rose Anvil 2 channel, so go watch the other West Co. video, subscribe to that channel, and thank you guys so much for everything you do. I love covering these boots and, and telling the history and, and really uh, showing you the truth of what's inside of these boots. So thank you guys. See ya.